Up next is a Macintosh Plus. This is another one of those Apple computers that I added to my collection years ago, but I don't really remember where it came from. Unfortunately, I don't have a keyboard or mouse for it, and those are actually pretty hard to come by because they're not ADB. They use a proprietary keyboard and mouse connectors on these older models. This one's actually pretty clean. Uh, I don't think I've ever tried to turn it on, so I have no idea if it works. I did check the battery port, and there's no corrosion in there. Uh, the battery compartment looks fine. So I'm going to open it up, take a look around the inside, see what it looks like before I try to turn it on. Fortunately, I just happen to have a Torx screwdriver that is the right size and should reach into this handle well. One down. Two. And four. One additional screw under the battery cover. I don't know if that's needed to take it apart, but it doesn't feel like it wants to come apart anyway, so we'll take that one out and see. It feels pretty, pretty stuck together. No indication that anything is loose. Okay, well, opening this up actually shouldn't be that complicated. It just gets stuck here, so we've got to separate the front. We've got to of plastic here that I'm going to try to use to there we go a little bit of prying right there come down the, the side and then we'll see if it'll lift off Pretty tight. Let me see if I need to. There we go. I think it should open up now. Something in there. There's a bit of dust in there. I have heard that these analog boards are notorious capacitors, other problems, just because of their age. So I'm gonna probably take that analog board out and give it a really thorough inspection. I'm not too concerned about the high voltages in here because this thing has definitely not been powered on for several years or longer. Uh, Logic board, I'll probably pull out take a close look at that too. But, uh, you know, general first impression is that it looks pretty good in here. I know with absolute certainty that this thing has not been powered on for at least 8 to 10 years. But I'm still going to go ahead and discharge it anyway, just to be safe. I'm in contact down here, so we're definitely discharged. There we go. 
analog board removed. Taking a very close look at this board, at all the components, and there's nothing really that concerns me except these capacitors right here. These are right near the mains input, and they look like RFI suppression capacitors, probably metallized paper in a plastic housing, and the plastic looks cracked. Those things burst in the house, it'll stink up the place for days, so I'm going to go online and see if I can find replacements for those. And while I'm in here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull out the logic board too and see what that looks like, clean the dust off of it. And I'll probably take out the floppy drive as well and uh, take a close look at that. The logic board appears to have four 256 kilobyte memory modules, which should be one megabyte, which I believe is the stock configuration. This board has a copyright date of 8687. I believe this computer came out in 86. The case plastic has a copyright date of 1988, so this couldn't be any older than 1988. The CRT here appears to have a date code of 89, so this unit could have been manufactured in 1989. I'm going to go ahead and remove the floppy drive too to clean the heads on it. dusty there. I'll leave this facing down so that it doesn't fall over. I probably don't need to do anything to the drive except clean the heads. So this is a double-sided drive so I'm going to have to clean the bottom and the top. It's a little bit tricky because these heads are floating. I want to take a look at the back side of this board now. Since this board is normally mounted vertically, heavy components like this flyback transformer or, tra or, uh, or this power transformer, and they have a tendency to wiggle around a bit and that can cause breaks or cold solder joints on the back side of the board. So I'm going to take this backing off, see if I can do it without too much trouble. There's one. I think I lost part of that. Do it a little more carefully this time. Okay. Push in on the middle pin. And pull them out. Okay. Decided to, to uh, switch tripods and try a different camera angle this time so I don't get in the way of it. You know, I want to examine the backside here very closely for any kind of cracks in the solder joints, especially around the flyback transformer. These pads here, I'm going to look for any cracks where the, the solder is cracked or the pads are lifted off. And if necessary, we can reflow some of that. And uh, while we're at it, I'm going to pull out those filter capacitors here and here. Uh, I don't have the replacements yet, but I'm just going to remove them so I can turn this thing on and see if it works. I flipped the board over and I set it on top of some boxes, some small boxes I had handy to give the tall components on the other side some relief. And I put some marks on the leads that I need to desolder just to make it easier to locate them from the back side. And I've got the soldering iron warming up. Since these two capacitors are RFI suppression caps, they're not necessary to run the power supply. They're only there for FCC compliance to prevent the computer from causing radio and TV interference to nearby systems. So it's okay to run them without it. When I get the replacements, I'll come back in here and put them back in.
Okay, it's always good to have a little solder on the tip. It helps transfer the heat a little quicker. You can only get so much of it with the solder sucker. These leads are bent over pretty far, so the part's not just going to fall out. Switch to some solder wick to finish cleaning up the rest of it and make sure the leads aren't stuck. That cap is definitely standing up a little taller. I just don't know if the leads are loose enough to pull it through. There we go. So one down. Definitely loose. Doesn't want to come out. There we go. Pull these pins all the way out, or as far out as they'll go, and then. Try to push it into the board without pushing in that pin. There we go. Well, the pins do come all the way out. There are some clips here on the uh, case that the board needs to seat into. And then over here, there are some plastic notches that it needs to seat into as well. It's really a lot easier to put back in than to take out. Okay, on camera smoke test in three, two, one. We got a ding. We have a pinpoint. Something's wrong. I think I forgot to hook something up. Of course, like an idiot, I did forget to hook something up. I never plugged in the deflection coils assembly. Okay, I'm going to discharge the CRT. I knew as soon as I saw that pinpoint on the screen that I forgot to hook up the uh, deflection coils. So... Let's stick it in there and see if we get a crack. I'll hook up here. No pop, no crack, no arc. It must be discharged. Now I'm going to try to get that deflection coil assembly plugged in. Bing. Oh, that's pretty. That's exactly what we want to see. Waiting for a boot disc. Next step, make a boot disc. A Macintosh G3. I don't know if it still works. I do know that it was working the last time we turned it on. This is my wife's old computer. It's been stored in the garage for a long time. It does have a floppy drive that's compatible with double density 800k disks and it has an ethernet port so we can get it on the internet download the images 
and write some floppies. And I was able to get that G3 running. This is uh, running Mac OS 9.2. I have a stack of double density disks. So I'm going to pop a disk in there and try to initialize it. And Mac OS standard 800K, let's see what happens when we initialize. I actually had to pull out an old monitor because the, uh, the current monitor that we have here wouldn't sync. Disk initialization failed. So that's the third time in a row we failed to initialize a floppy. I'm pretty sure that drive needs to be cleaned. So I'm going to have to pull that out and clean it. It's not my fault. Well, we successfully initialized the floppy drive that time. You should have seen the inside of that floppy. It was nasty. Well, after lots and lots of futzing around, I may have figured out you just got to download it from the right place. So, put it on a flash drive. There's system tools. Disk copy recognizes it as an image. That is a double-sided floppy. We will erase the system contents. And we might just have a bootable disk. There are four disks total, uh, but this system tools disk should be the primary bootable one. I guess, I guess 800k floppies take a while to write. And it has ejected. So, let's take it in, see if it boots. Okay, I still have the back off of this because I didn't want to close it up until I was sure everything was working. It's plugged in, power strips on, hit the power button. We have a picture. Waiting for a boot disk. It has ejected. Doesn't like that disk. I don't know why. Okay, so full disclosure. I screwed up big time when I cleaned the heads on this floppy drive. I've been working on computers for 30, 35 years. And I thought I knew what I was doing, but I've never dealt with these old Macintosh floppy drives before. If you lift up the head to get a Q-tip under there, you'll ruin the drive. This piece of copper right here that holds the drive head in place is soft. And when you lift up on this, that copper bends and then there's no tension holding the two heads together. I fixed it, but if you put a disc in and the head doesn't drop down, that's what you've done. It took uh, some effort to fix it. Um, I did it off camera, so I can't show you how, but I'll put a link in the description to another YouTube video that showed me how to fix it. I still have the system open so I can work on the drive. I've got the drive connected to the internal floppy port, and because it's open, I'm not going to feel around the back blindly. I got to look back, see the switch, turn it on.
There goes the floppy, and we have a happy Mac. Heads are moving, and welcome to Macintosh. The system works. Unfortunately, right now, I don't have a keyboard or a mouse, so I can't interact with it at all. I do have a keyboard on order from eBay and a mouse that I've bid on, so I have to wait for those parts to come in before I can go any further. And you have to take the logic board out to get to the screws that hold the floppy in. So I'm going to disconnect the floppy cable and the analog board. And one more time making sure it works when it's all put back together. Move the disc. Beautiful. Can't shut it down properly without a keyboard or a mouse, so you can't eject the disc. Hex wrench ought to do the trick. There it is.